Well, here it is, Halloween Ends, the finale to the latest trilogy in a franchise filled with lackluster sequels. But does this latest entry finally provide a satisfying conclusion? Of course not. What are you surprised? Hey guys, welcome back to the show, and on this episode I'm going to be talking about why I think Halloween Ends is one of the most disappointing Halloween movies I've seen. Now before I get started, I should mention that there are going to be spoilers in this review. I touched on this in the video I made last year on Halloween Kills, but I don't think I've ever seen a movie franchise get away with going in as many weird directions as Halloween has. I mean, it's all here. Remakes, reboots, multiple timelines, and some really bizarre storylines. But that's not really that surprising, especially coming from a franchise that's been going on for so long. Again, I'm pretty sure I said this in the video I made last year, but after all these movies, what's left to do? Well, let's take a look, shall we? The movie takes place four years after the events of the last two movies, and Laurie Strode is writing her memoirs and lives a quiet life in Haddonfield in a house with her granddaughter after she made a promise not to let fear run her life anymore. Which just seems kind of weird to me. I mean, keep in mind, this storyline negates everything that happened after the original Halloween. So Lori was attacked and her friends were killed in 1978, and then for 40 years, nothing happened. But Lori still isolated herself in a trap house with fences and spotlights in case Michael ever came back, even though she knew he was locked away. Then he escapes and goes on a total rampage, killing who knows how many people, including Lori's daughter. Then he just disappears, so he's on the loose. The whole town apparently starts going crazy with fear and paranoia over the next few years. And this is when Lori decides to stop preparing for Michael Myers? I would argue that it would make more sense if these versions of Lori were flipped. Lori in 2018 really doesn't have much of a reason to anticipate Michael coming back. Remember, she only encountered him once, yet she spent the past four decades preparing for his return. Lori in 2022 really doesn't have much of a reason to not anticipate Michael going on another killing spree. Even though she probably realizes at this point that he was never going after her specifically, he's still out there somewhere. And if you really wanted to move on with your life, why don't you start by moving to a new town? Why is that so out of the question? I get that she doesn't want to make decisions based on fear, but why would you want to stay in a town where everybody is paranoid and killing each other and killing themselves? I mean, that's just depressing. I got to imagine there's a small town out there somewhere where a psychopathic killer isn't at large. There's really no reason to stay. I'm sure Allison wouldn't be totally opposed to moving. I mean, what does she got to stay for? What, her parents and her friends? Oh, that's right, she doesn't have any because they were all murdered by Michael Myers. Is it a sentimental thing? Staying in the town where she has so many memories? Horrific, horrific memories. But who knows, maybe Lori just really hates moving. I mean, it is a pain in the ass. And besides, she's got stuff to do. She's got books to write and pies to burn. So at the beginning of the movie, we're introduced to a new character. Corey Cunningham, who accidentally killed a kid on Halloween night in 2019. At some point, these kids recognize him and start giving him a hard time because he won't buy them beer. And this is one of the most disappointing parts in the movie for me, because these are the high school marching band bullies. So I was expecting a much more synchronized beatdown. So Lori takes Corey to the hospital so that he can get stitched up and meet her granddaughter. And so begins the love story that director David Gordon Green wanted to tell. I'm not joking, by the way. He said that he wanted Halloween Kills to be the action movie and this to be the love story. In an interview with IndieWire, he said that, I wanted to write an action movie and a love story at the same time and see how they juxtaposed each other. And it was just fun because I like to mix it up in genres. I don't wanna just make the same movie over and over, the same genre, the same anything. I would literally be writing on the same day these two very opposite types of scripts. I knew where I wanted to go atmospherically and I knew I wanted to be very romantic and I knew I wanted to put my heart on my sleeve and make a movie about bad boys and motorcycles and leather jackets and that kind of thing. But the thing is, at no point would I ever call this movie romantic. And it's kind of a hard sell considering the tone 
of the last two movies, you know, with all the screaming and the stabbing and the murder. I mean, the first movie in this trilogy, you literally had a flashlight stuck inside a guy's hollowed out head. And now in the third movie, I wanna make this a love story. Don't get me wrong, I understand what he was trying to do and I can appreciate the ambition to try something different, but at the end of the day, this is a horror franchise. And one of my biggest problems with this movie is that not only is it not scary, but it doesn't even feel like Halloween. In spite of all the problems I had with Halloween kills, at the very least, it still felt like Halloween. I found the development of Corey and Allison's relationship to be weird and unconvincing. One of the reasons is that everything takes place over the course of four days, and Corey as a character feels completely shoehorned into this trilogy. Why? Probably because this is someone who we've never seen before, and not only is he suddenly one of the main characters, but the movie wants to make him into a main antagonist, working with Michael Myers. So Allison takes Corey to a Halloween party at a bar, and they seem to be having a great time, but what a coincidence, the mother of the boy who died three years ago is there, and she confronts Corey about it. Corey leaves the bar, and as he's walking away, what a coincidence, the marching band bullies happen to be driving by. So they destroy his glasses and throw him off a bridge. And this is when Michael Myers finally comes into play, folks. I know you've been waiting for this. He drags Corey into the sewer, because that's where he lives now, and does nothing for some reason. Corey eventually wakes up and goes to leave when Michael grabs him and starts choking him. And then as he looks deep into his eyes, uh, I don't know. I don't know if Michael sees evil in him. I don't know if he transferred evil into him, but whatever it is, it somehow performed some kind of an evil LASIK eye surgery because Corey's eyesight is just completely fixed and he never needs glasses ever again. Laurie starts getting suspicious of Corey because he's acting weird. He's acting kind of like Michael Myers. You know, standing in the bushes, going back to the house where he killed someone. And this is where he and Michael Myers start killing people together. As, you know, it's kind of like a tag team of murder, you know, like a duet. So Laurie is like, hey dude, you're kind of evil. You might not realize it yet, but yeah, I, uh, I don't really want you dating my granddaughter anymore. If I can't have her, no one will. Yeah, Lori, they've been dating for a few whole days now. What did you expect? You expect him just to break up with her? You, you can't just walk away from a foundation that solid. So Corey decides, fine, I'm just gonna have to kill Lori and a bunch of other people too because I'm totally in love with this girl that I started dating four days ago. He goes back to see Master Splinter and is like, yeah, you're not cool anymore. You're just an old man. And somehow he's able to beat Michael Myers and take his mask. Corey tries to kill Lori but fails and then tries to kill himself in an act to frame Lori for the murder because again, Allison is the love of his life and if he can't have her, no one will. You know what? I like this girl that I've been on a few dates with so much, I'm going to kill myself in order to frame her grandmother. Knock, knock. Hi, Lori. Just wanted to check in because I heard gunshots and you know, this is why we started the neighborhood watch. Just want to make sure you're okay. Oh my God. You always have the best decorations. I swear, you know, I just got this crappy plastic skeleton. It sucks, but you, it's, I don't know how you do it. Like, what did you, what did you use for the skin? That's crazy. Michael arrives and kills Corey because, I mean, Corey took his mask. And this is when we get the final fight between Laurie and Michael, where Laurie finally kills him. But then again, it's pretty hard to kill this guy. So they strap Michael's body on top of a car and kind of parade him down the street. The rest of the town kind of joins in. They take him to a junkyard where they throw his body into a shredder. And there you go, folks. There's your conclusion. A movie that feels very disconnected from the other two. And in the end, I feel you have a trilogy that's kind of a mess, quite frankly. When you consider all the places that this franchise has gone to over the past 44 years, 
I do feel like 2018's Halloween was a decent movie that got really close to providing a good conclusion. But this franchise always manages to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. It's amazing. I feel the same thing happened in 1998 with H2O. They made a movie that ignored almost all of the other sequels, and while it certainly had its problems, it provided what I think was a solid conclusion. There's a final battle between Laurie and Michael, and it ends with Laurie cutting off Michael's head. Roll credits. But they just had to screw that up with a ridiculous explanation and a movie that was so horrible for so many reasons. With Halloween 2018, once again, I feel you have a movie with a satisfying conclusion. But as stated by Danny McBride, who was one of the writers, he and David Gordon Green were going to pitch two movies, but then decided not to and waited to see the reaction to Halloween 2018. After Halloween did so well, they decided that instead of doing a story arc over two movies, to do a trilogy instead, because they realized they had more material than they had originally thought. Which is strange, because while I can see the connection between Halloween and Halloween Kills, Halloween Ends feels completely detached. Halloween Kills picks up right where Halloween left off, not just in story, but in tone as well. And by the end of that movie, there was momentum. Michael kills Karen, which sets up for an even more intense confrontation between him and Laurie. But Halloween Ends completely diffuses that intensity and even abandons characters and storylines that I feel were being developed. Halloween Kills starts with Hawkins talking about how he had the chance to stop Michael back in 1978. We even see a flashback showing us what happened. Hawkins then vows to be the one to kill Michael this time. He's taken to the hospital where he further talks about his regret to Laurie, and we see another flashback of how he was the one who stopped Loomis from killing Michael in 1978. In Halloween Ends, he appears in a couple of scenes and he's really only in the movie to just develop the love story between him and Laurie. My niece gave me a Rosetta Stone and now I'm learning Japanese. There was a storyline in Halloween Kills with the kids from the original movie. Lindsay is the only one of them to survive her encounter with Michael, leading her to do absolutely nothing in Halloween Ends. I'm serious, she flips some tarot cards and pours some drinks. The mortality of Michael Myers seems to be inconsistent throughout this trilogy. In Halloween Kills, Lori talks about how she used to think that Michael was just flesh and blood, but a mortal man couldn't survive what he's lived through. And she's right. But David Gordon Green says this isn't the case. In my own personal concept of Michael that will carry forward uh, as long as I'm involved is that he's a uh, he's capable of spectacular things, but not impossible. So I, I don't personally see him as supernatural. Michael has been shot and stabbed countless times and managed to survive by sitting in a sewer for four years. Even if that doesn't seem impossible, how about the fact that at the end of this movie, he gets stabbed in the heart and gets right back up. If there's nothing supernatural about him, then what is going on at the end of Halloween Kills when Karen sees Michael as a kid staring out the window? Is this a hallucination? And what about this whole thing between Michael and Corey? It seems like something supernatural is going on here. And after this happens, people say that Corey has changed, that when they look at him, it's not him. Lori even says he has Michael's eyes. I keep seeing his eyes, Michael's eyes in Corey. These last two movies have tried to convey the idea that it's not just Michael himself, but the fear he's created and instilled in the people of Haddonfield that's destroying the town and creating people like Corey, which I get, but personally, I never found this to be very well executed. The message about mob mentality in Halloween Kills was just so overdone that it just came off corny to me. Evil dies tonight! Evil dies tonight! Our evil dies tonight! Not evil dies tonight! Evil dies tonight. <laughs> And with this movie, again, I get the message about fear and paranoia and blame and how that infects a community and the consequences of that, but it feels like that's its own movie. And what happens with Laurie and Michael is secondary to that. And of course, a lot of people aren't gonna be happy with that, especially when in the end, the final confrontation that we get is nowhere near 
as intense as what we got with Halloween 2018. But with four different writers at the helm, is this a case of too many cooks in the kitchen? Or could it be that there's just not a lot of places left to go from a story standpoint? I would argue that that well ran dry a long time ago. And I believe the filmmakers knew that people would be divided over this movie. Maybe that's part of why they've been using the same font from the movies from 40 years ago. This movie obviously being a major departure, like Halloween 3. And even though this movie claims to be the end of Halloween, we all know it isn't. And I think that's what I find so amusing after all this time. Creatively, this franchise is like a dead cow that keeps getting resurrected in order to milk out a few more drops. But financially, this franchise is a goose that lays golden eggs. Just look at these numbers. There's not a chance that they're not going to come back again. So even if you hated this conclusion, as I did, don't worry because in a few years there will be another conclusion that you'll probably hate even more. But that's pretty much it for this one. As usual, thanks for watching guys, and I'll see you all next time. Also, where do you get your candy from? I'm just curious because I usually buy one of those big boxes with an assortment of candy bars. And quite honestly, I'll go through and pick out all the ones that I like, you know, like the Kit Kat and the Snickers, and then I'll give the rest out to the kids. You know, like the Arrow. I'm not that big of a fan of Arrow. It's not horrible. It's just that, I don't know. I feel like with all the air bubbles, you're kind of getting less chocolate. So Corey was babysitting this kid while his parents went to a Halloween party. And now that I think about it, I'm not a parent, but if I had a kid, there's just no way I would be leaving them home and going out to a Halloween party a year after somebody went on a killing spree the likes of which nobody has ever seen and was never caught. There's no way I'm leaving that house. I also find it funny that at one point these people go after Lori for what Michael did as if Lori has anything to do with that. Also, just based off of Allison's dating history in this movie, it's like, I just feel there's a lot of people here that need a tremendous amount of therapy. You know, not, not, not like once a week. I'm talking like a Costco buy in bulk amount of therapy.